you didn't just go out there and do product research, try to find a product and everything like that. You're in the game and you had a problem on your mind and then you found a product you were sold on and just went at it. Like, uh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I, I mean, I, I wish I could say that like we just dropped everything and, and went hard on this one thing, but we, we launched this like side of the desk and we we're like, it would be nice. It'd be nice if it was a million dollar business. That's, that was kind of like our outlook on it. What's going on guys. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Nick Terrio and today I have an exciting new video for you guys. Today, I got the co-founder of one of the second fastest growing brands in Canada for 2021. Um, Ryan, nice to meet you, man. Uh, would you go ahead and introduce yourself, man? <laughs> What's going on, Nick? Nice to meet you too. Thanks for thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm Ryan McKenzie. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, of True Earth. Uh, you you may or may not have seen seen the brand around. Um, we've had a lot of success with like funny viral videos and stuff like that. So a lot of there's been a lot of examples of our videos in in marketing form. So if you're a marketing guy, you you might have stumbled across uh, one of our videos that have cumul cumulatively uh, had more than. I, think like 200 million views. I checked out some of your, your Facebook ads. And I do have to say like what this guy says about his videos being different for than a lot of other people. He is 100% correct. Um, like some of your videos, like really reminded me of like the Harmon brothers and stuff like that. Um, what type of like production goes into that? Yeah. So I, I actually, so it's funny, the guy that, um, puts them all together for me. I actually met them through the Harmon brothers. So I was really interested in the Harmon brothers after I kind of skimmed through poop to gold. And I saw, you know, all their awesome funny viral videos, like the chat books one and uh, the fiber fix really checked the boxes for me. But um, so back in the beginning of COVID, I was really eager to put something together like that. And inside their community, I met this guy who had done one for Russell Brunson. And I was just like, what do you charge for that? And he, he, uh, kind of gave me his, his pricing model at the time. And I'm like, I, I'm going to, this is kind of weird to roll the dice and just give somebody I never met a bunch of money to, to try this out. And mm -hmm. we came up, came up with a couple ideas and um, uh, the things you should never mix with water was the first one that we did together. And it, it was like insane. Like it went insanely viral. Um, I think it's had something like 80 or 90 million views. But um, wow. the, the actual process, that's a story. The actual process, <laughs> sorry, I told you, I tangent. Uh, the, the, the process is pretty much like we come up with a bunch of different ideas and um, we come up with uh, the core script. Um, and then once we have the core script together, uh, Joe, he's the guy that I work with. He'll work with some comedians. So I think he gets a bunch of different people from local improvs mm -hmm. and they go through the script and they basically funny up all the different, all the lines or try to, try to, try to incre increase the entertainment value so that we keep people hooked mm -hmm. in. And then once we've uh, finalized the script, we, Joe uh, gets the talent and we film and we usually film a few different hooks so that we can, we can test a couple different angles. Cause you never know what's actually going to resonate mm -hmm. with people. And then we launch it's a, uh, it's about a three month process per video, I'd say. And out of that three month process, like how much of it actually goes into like the planning stages of it? Um, for on, on, on our side, I would say majority of it is just kind of like coming up with the different ideas that we're, that, that we want to work with. And then once mm -hmm. we've, we've, you know, with our team, Joe, Joe and company, um, they'll go and they'll flesh out a bunch of different ideas and then we'll, we'll edit it together. Um, and that's when kind of there's like, it's basically like, I don't want to say on our side, there's too, too much. Like it's pretty much dig digging through it. See if we like it, what are, mm -hmm. what are like the hard stops? What are the things that, that have got to go? And then, uh, you know, re reviewing what the, the actual funny people contribute because, you know, it's one thing to think you're funny uh, and tell yourself jokes and get your family to laugh at you, but it's a whole nother thing to get like the whole world yeah. actually cracking up, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's definitely something we see all the time. It's kind of like in the marketing department, we have this really crazy idea and then like, we all think it's really cool. And then like we launch it and then versus like a split test, that's like, eh, the split test always crushes it. <laughs> I yeah. think it's <laughs> I, 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 all I, the time. I, yeah. I, that, that happens to me too. Right? Like 
I feel like the more I overthink something or the more effort I put into making sure something's perfect, the worse it does. That's always the thing. It's always like the off the cusp idea that I put 30, 30 minutes into instead of like 30 hours that, you know, kills it. And I'm just like, I wish I could just put that in a bottle and sell it. Yeah. Yeah. So Ryan, tell us a little bit about True Earth. What exactly is True Earth for those who haven't seen any of your crazy videos yet? Yeah, so true, uh, true Earth, but we're, we're a household brand for consumer goods, and our mission is to help eliminate plastic um, from you know your traditional consumables and products that people use in home, or, or at least the single use versions of them. So um, mm-hmm. our, let's see, I probably have some here. Got to open up one of these Costco boxes. Um, the 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 main product, oops, is this little strip. So this is like, I mean, I got a big head, but uh, uh, this, this weighs like two to three, probably about two grams for one strip versus mm-hmm. like a load of liquid laundry detergent weighs 35, 35-ish grams. So it's very small. It's pre-measured. It's like, I mean, it's like, oh, Ryan, that's great. Tell me more about laundry detergent. I don't really care. But what's cool about, what's cool about this, and, and it's funny because you, you get like people who are actually excited about laundry detergent, which is a weird thing altogether. It's not like there's a like laundry detergent aficionado magazine or something like that. But yeah. like people are excited because they don't have like, you know, you do laundry and then you, you pour the stuff into the cup and then you pour it into your laundry and then you put the cup back on and then the ooze rolls down. The, the bottle and then you put it back in the cupboard and then you have like this sticky, sticky blue shit all over the bottom of your cupboard. And then you also have all these jugs that are piling up and it's just, it's, it's messy. Like it's weird because you're cleaning, but it's it, like, why is cleaning messy? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So this, this eliminates a lot of like the mess, the waste, the, the thought process. So like laundry is simple. Now you can give this to your kid, your kid can chuck it in there. Not, they're not going to put too much detergent or too little. Um, and anyways, I, I'm going on and on and on, but you know, we, we, tr- we create these, we try to create environmentally products that are not, not just like environmentally friendly because typically environmentally friendly products are either less effective or, or harder to use. So we try to make products that are easy to use, effective and eco-friendly and trying to remove the stigma of stuffiness from being, uh, you know, con- caring about the environment and the world we live in. I like that. Now, was this like one of those kind of like Eureka movements when you like kind of like found like this idea to create this kind of like eco-friendly brand or was this something kind of due to like product testing and things like that? Like how did it like all start? So yeah, yeah, good question. Um, so we actually had the product presented to us. Um, my business partner, one of my business partners, Brad, his, um, his extended family member had invested in the patent. And they were looking for somebody to, um, I don't know, basically get it off the ground because they were inventors. Uh, they weren't marketers and they had presented it to us. And like, I was just like, I hadn't seen it, but I'm just like, okay, first of all, the laundry detergent industry, like we're just going to get squashed if we enter Second of all, like, <laughs> how is this going to clean your clothes? And then, <laughs> and then like, third of all, I was thinking from like a direct response perspective, like, uh, like how, would this, how could we ever make this profitable? Like we're competing with guys that have billions of dollars in budget. Um, and we had, we, we, we had some, like we had done quite a few subscription boxes in the past. Mm-hmm. And so they'd come to us because they're like, Hey, this could be like the dollar shave club of, of laundry detergent. And, uh, you guys, you guys know how to do subscriptions. Let's, let's go. Right. And, uh, so we kicked it down the road for a while and, um, I have three kids now, but I had two at the time. And, uh, I was kind of concerned about the future of like, I wasn't concerned about the future until I had kids. Like I was just like, whatever, I'll survive. I'll live under a rock or whatever. I'll make a shelter out of cardboard boxes. Uh, but once I had kids, you know, you start considering like, what's, what, what are they going to do? Like, what's, is there going to be overpopulation is, or is AI going to take the jobs? Like, you yeah. know, <laughs> and uh, so I was getting a lot of anxiety about that. Now that's now switched to, uh, econ- economic, uh, considerations, but, uh, my anxieties were piling up about, you know, the environment and stuff. And this kind of came along at a time where I'm like, well, this is something that I could kind of, I feel like I'm contributing to a positive future for my kids instead of just, you know, complaining about it, virtue signaling. And, uh, so we launched it and we were like, okay, if we sell a hundred, hundred of these, uh, 
150 of these in the first month, then we're going to move forward with the product. And we sold uh, mm-hmm. more than 1500 subscriptions in month one. And, you know, here we are two and a half years later and we have like 160,000 active subscribers or so wow. approximately. Yeah. It's a couple, a couple. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, there's a lot of things that just came up to my mind. For one, um, first off, you obviously seem like you've had a marketing background before coming into this brand. Um, were you kind of like a freelancer, like an agency? How did that look like for you? Yo, I'm I'm like old man in this internet marketing space, man. Um, so I, I've done like a million different things from affiliate marketing to I had an SEO agency for a while. Um, I, I used to do uh, click arbitrage, uh, a lot of media buying, uh, just like uh, I had a, I had a, a SaaS for, or not a SaaS. I had a startup that um, where people could, can contribute content and they receive 75% of the revenue. Mm-hmm. I've done did subscription boxes. I own, I own, I still own uh, print, print magazines. So like I've like touched a lot of different things over the years. And I think like, for me, like there, there was a number of them that were successful, like that, you know, mid, mid seven figure businesses. Um, this is the first one that ever got to the eight figure mark. Um, but for me, like building all these different skills, it was like, it was like playing in the farm league uh, of like, you know, professional, professional, uh, professional sport or professional athlete analogy, you know, it was, it was playing in the farm leagues. And when this finally came along, put in, we had put in enough reps that we were ready to take something to the next level when, when the opportunity arose. Like that. Now, were you like always like entrepreneurial going into all of this? Cause you, you definitely seem like you kind of dabbled in a few different things within the marketing perspective. Um, was it driven kind of through like, like an entrepreneurial vision? Like did you always kind of like vision itself for you? Yeah. I mean, since I've dude, like, since I was like probably six, there was like, it was lemonade stands. And then uh, it's funny because my other partner, Kevin Hinton, we've gone, we've been friends since kindergarten. We we're like mm-hmm. best man in each other's weddings. And like, we were, we've been scheming since we were little kids. Like it was, <laughs> we were, we tried to make, we got taught how to make bracelets in grade three. And we were like buying all this gimp trying to celebrate. Like it's been yeah. like, collecting pop bottles. Like it, it's, it, it's, 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 uh, it's probably the, my biggest hobby, I guess, is thinking about ways to think about businesses. And I know that some people think that that might be sad or, or whatever, but it's, it, it's what captures my interest and you know, it's, it's what I do. I mean, I think it's really cool, but I, so there was never like this, you know, the typical Lambo across the street. I want one of those type of visions was there. You know, when I was younger, like I'm, I'm 40 now, Ugh, uh, mm-hmm. I don't know how that happened, but when I was like 20, 24, uh, you know, I, I, the Lamborghini dream, uh, was, was real. Uh, but I had a, I had a fall from grace. <laughs> I had a fall from grace around, uh, 26 where we had like a six figure a month business and it essentially collapsed overnight. Mm-hmm. And I had like, I had a fairly expensive car and I had a condo and I, I just bought a house and I like basically had no money and I live in Vancouver. So that doesn't work. It's expensive as hell here. Um, and I had to go sell cell phones, man. I had to go get a job at the mall. Like I thought I was this like baller at like 24, 25, huge fake diamond earrings and all that crap that, you know, <laughs> a vision that probably I wouldn't, wouldn't have for myself today, but I had to go sell cell phones and learn sales and, uh, and kind of rebuild working like the evenings at the, at the cell phone store and on the weekends and then during the day on the business. And that took me like probably four years to get back to a good spot again. And it really humbled me because, you know, I had all this crap or what I thought was like amazing things but it's like this hedonic treadmill, right? Like you get one thing and then you just need the next thing in order to, to feel good again. And uh, so like, you know, I like nice cars and stuff like that, but it's not, that, does, that isn't like a goal of mine. My, my goal personally is just like lifelong autonomy. I want to be able to do what I want. I want to do it when I want, how I want. I want to not have to think about if I want to take my family to go stay at a hotel, you know, an hour away um, for something to do. Like that's to me, that that's like the real goal because stuff doesn't stuff sucks, man. It's like a, it's like a freaking anchor, you know, like 
you you get it and then like i bought a snowblower on the 30th of last month and i was so freaking excited to get this stupid <laughs> snowblower and like i just got the idea i was actually at a hotel an hour away we went for a night and i was like it fucking snowed like crazy it snowed again last night actually too mm-hmm. but i bought the snowblower and i bought it brought it home and i put it together and it was broken but i'm like i'm gonna make this i'm gonna use it anyways and i'm gonna return it and I was going to, I was trying to exchange it, but they don't make them anymore. And I was like getting upset about it. And I, I thought like, I finally, I returned it two days ago um, and got my money back, but I was having a hard time because like, I was like so excited about the stupid snowblower. And after I'd used it, I, I sat there and talked to myself. I'm like, why do you, why do you like, you've already, you already opened it up. You put it together, you used it. You got all the, like the, the exciting part out of it. Why don't you yeah. just take it back? Fuck it. It's broken. And I took it back and I felt pretty good about getting my money back. I got like, I got like doubled down on my dopamine for, for one thing. So um, this is a That's stupid really example, cool. <laughs> you know, but it, it, it's not a Lambo. It's a snowblower. But uh, once you get the thing and you open it and use it, you're not really getting the dopamine's gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I do find that, um, you know, for someone like me, I've, I've been in this for a little, little while and I've been in the game for like five years. And, you know, originally it started off with just, oh, one day I want to buy a Lamborghini and stuff like that. And um, still not there yet. But after being able to just get a few things, you know, nice apartment, um, one of my other dream cars and everything like that. Now I'm like, I don't really care for shit anymore. Like, like what like brings me my fulfillment, my dopamine and stuff like that is, working with other brands and just being in that entrepreneurial spirit of starting up businesses, investments and things like that. And I think it's just having that more of that love for the game um, that carries you so much further. Because then once you realize you get that shit, it's just like, eh, you know, hey, totally. it's, it's cool. It's cool. You know, you finally feel that accomplishment, but the dopamine tanks quick. Yeah. Like if, you, if you're into motorsports, cars are cool, right? Like if you want to go like race cars or you're into like souping them up or whatever, like that's one thing, that's a hobby. But like, there's people that just want it, like a, a Lamborghini for status. And like, that's, that's fleeting. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're seeking status, it's fleeting. It's always going to be, mm-hmm. it's just, I don't know. And I, I you know, I, I know that everybody's life's a bit different. And just for me personally, that's, that's kind of, the lesson that I've realized is like the debt that it takes to hold on to these stupid things. Uh, you know, it's not worth the, the juice ain't worth the squeeze. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I completely understand. Now digging into that moment where you had that little like dark period of time. And cause I know you were, you're doing the marketing stuff. You had a business take off, had a little period of time where it's kind of like take a step back, reset everything, and then like get back into it. What was kind of keeping you like, what was your North star during that period of time? Yeah, that, oh, man. Like, so again, it was the whole autonomy thing, right? Like I just wanted to get back to where I controlled my time, controlled my freedom. Um, and I actually wanted to quit if you like, there is a number of times where I contemplated quitting because like the, the, the entrepreneurial journey is very, it's very up and down. Right. And like Mm -hmm. that, that business didn't wind up working out the one that I was chasing, you know, I'm lucky. I I found my way into some other things that um, worked out for me, but like with that, with that platform where people could contribute and we shared the revenue with them, uh, we got to like 50 million visitors a month. And then, Google rolled out all these updates that negatively impacted SEO. And it was like, man, we spent like two years trying to fight that battle to fix it. And it was just like this slippery slope. You'd like take two steps or you'd like, you know, we're down, we were up here, we came down here and then we'd go up this far and then we'd fall slide back down and we'd come back up this far and we'd slide back down. And I, I just felt like I was always so stressed out, like just because it was, the, it felt like the the rug was being pulled out from underneath me. All this thing that I put all this time in, I basically, you know, I basically gave up my my freedom from the time I was like twenty to thirty, uh, working on these projects and between having a job and 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 also trying to be an entrepreneur, and it felt like I just never wound up making progress. We'd make progress and then it would all go away, and uh, I probably had PTSD from that. But um, you know. I think people, when they're in those down moments, have a tendency to think 
like in very binary terms, like I'm a failure or I'm a success. There's like, it's difficult to see the middle ground and it's difficult to pivot and it's difficult to try something new because you've been beat down so much. All you see is like, I suck. I, I can't do this. I'm not cut out for this. Um, maybe, maybe again, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Is it, am I doing the right thing? Is this the right business? Is this going to, you know, it's uh, the, the down parts as much as they give you perspective, once you get out of them, uh, it's easy to get into these feedback loops of negative narrative that, that push you away. And I think unless you have this in your DNA that you have to be, you know, an entrepreneur, I think most people get pushed away when that narrative starts to uh, get to come to the surface. Yeah. I, I really like that. You touched kind of down on that, that narrative and the binary aspect. And um, I, I think when you kind of fall or have a little period of time where you kind of have to, you know, you, you're not doing so great. Um, you look at reality as it is and you kind of like, some people try to predict the future. And that's one thing I've learned after working with like Dr. Joe Dispenza, you cannot predict the future at all. And if you can sit there and think, oh, you know, this is going horrible, my failure, things like that. You can just as easily say like, hey, I'm still successful. Like I, I can overcome this, things like that. And like that self-talk is so important. I think when it comes down to just the mindset of being a founder, advertising everything and i have to I have to question you on this just because we know like how old school you are with like the seo because yeah. like when i was first getting into advertising like you know it was facebook ads and I, a year later i started learning about the seo crash and everything like that how much ptsd hits you with 14.5 <laughs> um you, not as bad as you probably would think um, you know, I knew it was coming for a while and, mm. you know, you can, you can't control the things that you can't control. Like, you know, same thing with like, when you're in a bad situation, like you, you can, you're responsible for how you react to, uh, the environment. And like, you know, obviously I was frustrated with the, the way that the pricing, um, went, but you know, my 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 instinct is like, okay, well, I can't control what Facebook's doing. What can I control? I can control, um, I can control how much I how many tests I do on our site to in in increase conversion rate. So if I can't control how much I'm paying for traffic or 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 how much I'm paying per visitor or per purchase, um, I can impact that by controlling other things like uh, like I said, like uh, the conversion rate on our site. So what can I do to improve? The quality of my site so the traffic i do get converts better what can i do to increase my average order value on my site so that when i pay more for a customer it's okay because i made more money um what other ways are there to uh get first party data um that i can leverage like like how do i get more email addresses how do i get more sms mm -hmm. um uh, contacts in my database that i can you know uh, send messages to over and over again for, for one fee. So, uh, I'm not going to lie and say that it hasn't sat in the back of my head and, and stressed me out because it, it hundred percent, it does. Um, and it, and it did. Um, but you know, everybody has to deal with it and, uh, I'm not alone in it. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if I, you know, I've overcome a lot harder challenges than, um, one revenue or one uh, one revenue source drying up like there are plenty of other ways to to do business and i think like if your only skill set is leveraging leveraging facebook's algorithm you're 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 setting yourself up for for failure right just like mm -hmm. i did before when we lost all of our google traffic and i've been hit by google updates when i was very big into seo like a, a ton of different times and it sucks it's debilitating um but it's an opportunity to be like, okay, well, what other valuable skills can I learn to grow my business um, that that frees me from the chains of of one uh, single point of failure? Yeah, yeah, I really like, yeah, I really like how you go about it, like almost like that SEO thing, kind of like taught your lessons. Where like when you built this new business, you kind of took that hindsight of not just one traffic source. And I know that's like a big thing that 
you know, 14.5, very rough for a lot of brands, like without a doubt, people got hit. But for us as an agency, we grew a lot from it that, you know, we, we had two options, adapt or stay in your lane, you know, stay, keep thinking things are going to be the same and you're just going to dry up. It's, yeah. So like, that's a really big thing. Now, going back to, you know, you had your little time where you kind of like took a little break, kind of not to take a break, but you kind of took a pull back, reset your life and stuff. And then true earth, like, was it like, that's the first business you kind of got back into it? Or did you start getting some businesses back up the ground and then was able to um, then get positioned with the opportunity of true earth? Yeah. So, I mean, th- this like, I mean, for timeline, the, the whole down period started like, I think mm-hmm. it was like 2009, 2009, 2010. Excuse me. Sorry. That was, yeah, that was when I had to start doing sales again or, or had to start doing sales. And then <laughs> uh, in 2014, we did a merger. I got in, into like the media space and we were doing, I uh, got some magazines and uh, magazines have their own sets of problems where like people aren't reading them as much or buying them as much. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that was kind of where we uh, started getting successful again with, with subscription boxes. So we had an outdoor adventure subscription box um, that was a huge success. Uh, it's actually still, it's still around. Um, and uh, the magazine is Explore Magazine. It's the, I think it's the oldest, longest running outdoor adventure magazine in Canada. It's, I think it's four, it's 40 years old this year. Wow. So, yeah. And that, we owned a couple other ones. And then I wound up uh, working with another company to help them build a subscription box, which I think went on to become one of the biggest uh, female subscription boxes in Canada. And then, uh, yeah, I've helped a few people launch subscription boxes. So like when when this opportunity came around, it was like, well, subscription, you know, subscription magazines, subscription boxes. I used to have a subscription ringtone service back in like 15 years ago. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm all in on subscriptions, man. <laughs> yeah. I really like that, you know, like most people with this product, you know, they'd probably scale it to seven figures and then they'd probably like, okay, hey, like acquisitions eating me alive. And then you took it as putting in a subscription service. And I love subscription services like Amazon subscription services. I have a few products that use every 30 days, need to get some more. So like it auto subscribes to me. So like, I got to compliment you on that side. Cause like, I know that's where like, it's really like kind of taken off in your business. Yeah, I actually, I got to get some just for men, man. My hair is like getting a little, a little too gray here. <laughs> Clearly, I buy it, I dye it, and then I forget about it and I don't redo it. Next thing you know, I'm looking old again. But yeah, the subscription, <laughs> subscri- subscription uh, for the people that like subscriptions, like that are happy to get auto renew, it's fantastic. Um, now, what are, um, for someone that's like, I guess, dabbling in, the e-com space right now. And, um, and I think this also kind of goes back to like how you got started with true Air I really like the fact that and this is another one to kind of take things was that like, you didn't just go out there do product research, try to find a product and everything like that. You're in the game and you had a problem on your mind and then you found a product you were sold on and just went at it. Like, uh, I like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I, I mean, I, I wish I could say that like we just dropped everything and, and went hard on this one thing, but we we launched this like side of the desk and we we're like, it would be nice. It'd be nice if it was a million dollar business. That's that was kind of like our outlook on it. And then yeah, that 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 didn't happen. It got quite a bit bigger than that, quite a bit faster. But um, <laughs> and then everything else went up went up getting pushed to the side a little bit. But um yeah, um it's when, you, when we try to set goals when we launch businesses, because a lot of people go into business and they're like, Oh, I'd love, for, I'd love to have like, you know, I'd love for this to be a million dollar a year business. And they launch and they make no sales. And then like a month goes by and they're still making no sales. They're not making any progress. Like, well, how am I going to get to this point? And a lot of times an offer is not the right fit for the market. And you can sit there trying a million different things, but you either have to pivot or put a bullet in it. And one of the things that we do when we launch a business is we have this formula we call V loss. Uh, it's not a formula; it's a structure. Uh, validate, launch, optimize, scale. And in the, in the V, we basically we validate the data uh, that there is demand, and we uh, we basically launch with a a target goal. Like for us, it was 150. If we didn't sell 150 of these in the first month, uh, it it was most likely put a bullet in it because 
you can't, you can't, you can't, can't get romantic about any particular business. If you start something and it's not, it's not flying, like, man, like you can spend years trying to fix things, which I talked about earlier. And you only have so much time on this planet. You can mm-hmm. make a fucking offer like a month, you know, you can make an, you can make as many offers as you want. And, and the way that the world is right now, you can, you don't even necessarily need to have the product in your hand. Like you can, I'm not, promoting drop shipping, but like, if you have an idea for something, you, you, you can test it and drop ship some, something off Amazon to somebody for the first couple of customers, just to, to validate that it works. You don't need, that doesn't even need to be your brand. All you need to do is prove that people want whatever it is that you're trying to sell. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just rambling here, but the moral of the story is, is, you know, don't, get so married to a product or an offer or an idea that you're afraid to put a bullet in it because you only have so much time on this planet. And if something's not working and it's not selling, chances are no matter how you slice and dice it, it's not going to magically start selling itself. Yeah. I really like that you touched on the fact that like about romanticizing about things. And I remember like in the early days of advertising, I used to like romanticize over like certain ads and stuff like that. Like, oh, I think this ad's going to crush it and I'll give it a little bit more spin versus the other one that showed me clearly it's working better, but that one I'm not as favorable for. Um, what I'm starting to notice as, as I talked more about these e-com brand owners and stuff like that is, you know, I used to have this old like relationship in my head of like, these econ brand owners will, you know, they just have this big idea one day and they're they're about this particular product and they're they have a huge vision for it and they're like sold on and in love with it and like that. And, you know, your typical like Mark Zuckerberg, these inventors and stuff like that. But then I'm also starting to see this new age of like econ brand owners where it's like they've developed a set of skills. Exactly like you said, validating products quickly, launching products quickly, and then quickly figuring out if it's something worth to invest more in or not and moving on to the next one. And I'm seeing those do even the same as good as some of these big inventors or even better. Um, and they're able to move quickly. And I think it's really cool to see like that kind of movement in the space. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it's there, there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur in like the history of human beings, like, you know, the the accessibility that you have to to sell things without physically having to to talk to somebody face to face is, is unbelievable. And I mean, you can test stuff without even actually selling it. Like you could, you could, you can push people all the way to a sales page, have them fill out the form. And then when they click submit say, Hey, I'm out of stock. Sorry. We'll let you know when you have more, more in. So you you don't even freaking need to have the stuff that you want to test. You can just like, you can, you know, you can totally mock the whole thing. And, uh, I don't think, I think people overcomplicate it. I think they spend too much time creating that grand vision. I'm not saying that you don't need that for, you know, a big brand, but when you're starting, I mean, you know, it's, again, it's nice to lay in bed at night and dream about stuff, but like, just put the, put the the rubber to the pavement or whatever the, the best trite cliche I can spit out here, just get her done make it work, try it out, test it. If it doesn't work next thing, you know, move on to the next one. Now I'm curious. Uh, we talked a little bit about these videos you have that are very powerful. Um, were some of these like crazy comical videos and stuff like that used in that first initial launch to help you sell at first, what, 150 products? Nope. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the first, so what I used the first, the first ad that never existed was like uh so our packaging originally wasn't even cardboard we had a recyclable plastic um which in retrospect uh, uh you know a lot of plastic doesn't get recycled so we had, mm-hmm. we had this guy sitting on like uh, a washing machine and there was my hand holding a strip i don't know what the hell i did with that i had one of these strips i don't know wherever it was just holding it over the washing machine and i i literally took it in my basement with my iphone um, no, no fancy camera, no fancy lighting. <laughs> and uh, that, that picture probably sold like the first, I don't know, 5,000 subscriptions, maybe something like wow. that. Wow. And I'd had a couple other, I had a couple other images and ads and stuff like that too. But like that one, again, it was like when we launched it, I basically created five different pieces of copy and like five different headlines and had like maybe two different images. And mm-hmm. the first day we actually didn't sell any, like 
the first day it was like just crickets. And then day two, the, op- the optimization started happening on the Facebook side. And uh, I, I was like taking my kids to swimming lessons. And I was like, ding, 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 stripe, stripe, <laughs> like notifications popping up. And I was like, like just like dopamine junkie. And my, my wife's like, put your phone away, Ryan. And I'm like, okay, I got to go to the bathroom. Uh, I'm like, you know, looking at my phone, like, and I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. But um, it's, it's funny though, you know, uh, when you, when you launch a new offer, it doesn't matter how big your other offers are like seven, eight figure, whatever. When you get a new offer and you make that first sale, there's like, that's like the best dopamine. There's no, there's no, there's no better feeling than the first sale. It doesn't matter. Even if it's a $5 product, like you could have like 50, $60 million in revenue that year. And you just sold something new that was $5. You're just like, Oh yeah, give it to me. You know, like, <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. Um, you know, in, in November, we helped the brand hit their first ever million dollar month. And then nice. we also helped the brand hit their first ever $10,000 day. And the, the fact is like the million dollar month was great, but the $10,000 day was way more satisfying because like this brand never seen more than $2,000 in a day in revenue. That's huge. So it was, it, I still get ecstatic over those, those newer, those smaller brands that we can come in and like help them out reposition some stuff because then it's, it's i don't know it's just something about it um like you said a new offer validating things or even taking an old thing and just kind of reshaping it and then relaunching it and it's just it, it's fun it's, it's a dopamine rush for sure yeah that's, that's the best that's the best feeling i i, I love i love new offer days Especially only if they work though if they don't work it's not it's not as yeah. good not as fun <laughs> I feel like right now too, with like TikTok I f- and your product, I feel like it feels like you were launching like today. I just could only imagine of just like sending it organically to a bunch of TikTokers and yeah. how even quicker, you know, that scale could have happened. Totally. We actually, we actually just went viral on TikTok over Christmas break. Like we had like 3 million views on one video. I mean, it's not crazy viral, but like... Mm-hmm. It's free, 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 free virality. But uh, yeah, had like 3 million views over the, over the last week. All right. Like 30,000, 20, 25,000 new followers. Wow. That's awesome. And are you just starting to get into like the TikTok side for the business? Uh, we've been like dabbling in it for probably a year, a little over a year. Um, but we're, we're getting, we're getting more serious with just like the, like creating content there. And we're, we're doing a little bit of advertising, not a ton, um, you know, there's still some attribution challenges there as well. Um, but like, I just feel like, how can you not be there? Like, it's just, it's, I, I swear to, if I pick up TikTok, I'm like off, I'm gone. I'm not even here physically anymore. I'm gone for like an hour and I'm like, Oh, I feel dirty. Like I just spent an hour inside this world and I, I, I don't even know how that happened. You know, it's like, you find an account that you, you know, something was interesting. And the next thing you know, you've like scrolled through all of their posts. And like, I'm like, I feel like a, a, a creep. <laughs> the dopamine that you yeah. get from TikTok is completely next level because it's sharp, quick burst of it. And literally every swipe, you never know what you're getting next. Yeah. Like I don't, honestly don't even follow anyone on TikTok. I'm just completely reliant on just that, that algorithm to serve me stuff and it's crazy of how quickly it optimizes too um yeah you know you watch like two or three videos of a specific genre next day it's all you see on your feed um so two things um first off what are you guys doing are you guys using anything like hiro's wicked reports or anything like that um going 2022 with 14.5 like how did y'all adapt to that did y'all use any like kind of special tracking software for that no, we, I mean, I've used Wicked Reports before on a, on a previous brand. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, we're contemplating uh, going into using, using like uh, Rockerbox potentially. Um, there's a few different companies that we're talking to, Northbeam. Um, but I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm really back and forth on it. Like the, the, the price, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether or not the price, I don't know, again, if the juice is worth the squeeze, like you pretty much, mm-hmm. you still need somebody who's uh, very, fairly fluent in like kind of the whole data science side of things to, mm-hmm. to, to, to make it work for a brand. Um, on a smaller brand, I feel like it's probably a waste of money. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've used, like, we don't use anything. We use GA, that's it. Um, and I spend like a million and a half a month. So uh, that's impressive. If you think that you need it for ten thousand dollars, 
Yeah, no. You're probably you're probably <laughs> selling yourself on something you don't actually need. Um, I see the value in it in the coaching space, uh, coaching space, and places where there is a longer uh, uh, nurturing period, uh, specifically where you're like capturing leads on the front end, and you want to be able to uh, attribute that back to a particular campaign over an extended period of time. But like for products that have fairly quick turnaround, I don't know. I just think like it, it's there. Don't get me wrong. It, it has its place. You just need to make sure that you're using it. If you're not using it, if you're not paying close attention, then you're just wasting your money. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that. Um, also like that you brought up the fact about sell cycles. Um, I feel like honestly, if you have a sell cycle or an AOV with less than 150 bucks, and, you know, people typically purchase within two to seven days of first seeing your product. Um, a lot of our brands, honestly, within the first 48 hours, they purchase. And after yeah. that, it's a very small percentage, like 30% of people purchase after that. Um, so, like, I feel like you don't really need it. And also, too, like, just tracking, like, every day your numbers in terms of, like, MER of, like, how much you spend on each channel, your total revenue and identify correlations and stuff like that. So, um what is your, and this will, be, this will relieve everything off at for today. What is your predictions for e in 2022? Oh, good question. Uh, I, I think my answer probably changed in like last two days. Um, <laughs> because, Things move quick. <laughs> you know, well, this new round of COVID with this Omicron thing. Um, I actually like, I'm, I don't, I'm not like, uh, I'm not like living under a rock or anything like that. I'm in Vancouver mm. and it's, it's pretty crazy here, but like it's been blowing up here and I just kind of have been ignoring it. But some of the signs that I've been noticing that I think we're going to be getting another like uh, April, 2020 uh, big push to e-com again, is that grocery stores right now, like we do like this thing called click and collect or something like that, where you like order your stuff online you just go pick it up at the grocery store. They drop it to your car. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like two or three day window. Usually you can just get it the same day. And like, I'm on top of a building, like below down there is a grocery store. And yesterday at like one o'clock, I went down there for, to grab like some, some vegetables or whatever to snack on. And there's like, this is Monday. It was, it was Monday or yesterday, Tuesday, every, whatever day it was, it was Monday, I think. And like, there's like an insane amount of people in the store at one o'clock. And there's like, like lineups all the way through the store. I'm like, people are going back to, to panic mode and looking at uh, our sales in the last week or so too, they're, they, they, they're, they're uncharacteristically high uh, specifically like D to C, but also even on Amazon. Mm-hmm. And I'm attributing it to uh, people getting concerned about wanting or, or like not wanting to get Omicron and trying to avoid being out in, in like, um, quote unquote, dangerous places. Um, I think, I think that like, I I mean, I'm not really concerned about, I'm I'm not trying to say like, I'm like, I'm not not like anti COVID or whatever, but like, I'm not super concerned about this personally, but I think a lot of other people are super concerned about it. And I think we're going to see for at least the next 60 days, uh, as this thing fleshes out a, a pretty good spike in, people shopping online versus in person. Nice. Nice. I really like that as I haven't really been paying too much attention about that. Um, but I do know there's been a lot more new talk kind of in the air about things. So, um, I'm still having to really formulate my full opinion of like where things were going to go, but, um, that's interesting. Uh, I'm glad to kind of start to see like a, a different perspective on that kind of going into the year. And, uh, you know, that'd be, Interesting to see how January does because January is notoriously kind of like a bad month for e-com, I would say. Um, I feel like you you probably don't really see too crazy of a difference uh, for January um, just due to the nature of your product. It varies. Like last year, we launched a, a funny video, so we crushed it. But um, this year, we're not launching any crazy funny videos in January. But, <laughs> yeah. And like pol- political things aside, I just, I, I, based on kind of the, some of the stuff that I've seen, I think like, mm-hmm. I think uh, at least here, but a lot of these sales that I'm seeing are in the, in the U.S. So I think I think that there's uh, there's going to be pockets where where um, people are, are are more concerned. And um, again, politics aside, I think that's going to probably uh, increase the amount of people shopping online versus uh, versus in, in traditional retail. Definitely, definitely, especially as more like 
I think just over time, more and more retail stores will kind of just slowly kind of dwindle. But again, that's looking at like the next 10, 20 years and stuff like that. So, um, well, cool. Uh, channels you need to be on in 2022. I think we kind of already covered this, but what's like your, like, I would say your top, your pick of the year of where you kind of, we would shift your attention to. I'm still super bullish on YouTube. I think like creating content, uh, I think creating content on YouTube is um, the place to be like, you know, it's the second largest search engine in the world. Uh, Mm -hmm. The content isn't, it's not like TikTok or Instagram or Twitter where it's here and then it's gone. It's, you know, if, if it resonates with people, it's there forever and it can produce for you on an ongoing basis. Um, Oh, that's not exciting. Um, You know, if we want to talk about something exciting, I would probably say, uh, you know, digging more into TikTok and Mm -hmm. just the leverage you can get if you can, if you, if you know how to create content for that platform, there's no shortage of eyeballs, you know, like it's really, it's TikTok is about working the algorithm. If you can, if you can work the algorithm, it's, I I don't necessarily, I'm not going to say that you're going to make it rain, but you're going to get the attention that you want and you can, you know, retarget those people potentially on other platforms if you can get them to click through. That's awesome. Yeah. I hundred percent agree with you on that. Uh, I think TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, huge for us. Um, Facebook and t- Facebook kind of more bullish on the advertising perspective, but TikTok and YouTube more for that organic traffic. I mean, it's, it's crazy to see like how much organic traffic can actually do to like help out lift your overall revenue and stuff like that. So, um, sure. but cool. Well, Ryan, it was a pleasure having you on. Do you have any last words before we uh, finish up for today? No, I'm, 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 I'm boring today. I don't have, I don't have any <laughs> wise words of wisdom, but uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, it's been a pleasure hanging out with you. You welcome, man. Yeah, no, definitely. was a great time. Um, are you active on anything social uh, personally um, yeah. you want to share? Or? Sure. Yeah. You can, you can find me uh, on, on Facebook. I think my accounts, uh, I think it's uh, it's just Ryan McKenzie. You'll probably see a picture of me with my kids. Um, I'm on I'm on LinkedIn. I don't I don't post a ton on LinkedIn, but um, uh, yeah, if you connect with me, I pretty much accept everybody on LinkedIn. If you connect with me on Facebook, just send me a message because I'm, I'm I, I if somebody doesn't send me a message, I just ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 awesome awesome and and obviously go pick up some true earth do you say like you can get at costco too it's at costco it's online in Co- at costco canada but um if you go to um if you go to tr- www.tru.earth e-a-r-t-h and uh you I'll, I'll fire up a coupon code put in like a, a nick t10 uh, that's n-i-c-k t one zero and you'll get 10 percent off Sweet. Well, I appreciate it. Why not? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, look, Ryan, it was a pleasure having you on, man. Um, and thank you guys, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, see y'all later. Cheers. Peace. Later. <laughs>